Hello and welcome to today's IWCS webinar. My name is Connie and I'll be the producer for your event today. Now I am pleased to turn the webinar over to Ed Fitton, your IWCS moderator. Ed, please go ahead. Thank you, Connie. Our IWCS webinar series event is hosted by the International Cable and Connectivity Symposium. I am Ed Fenton, a cable industry advisor working with the IWCS team. As Connie said, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box on the bottom right of your screen to post a question anonymously. If you wish to contact the presenter or IWCS after the presentation, you will be given the contact points at the end of the webinar. Please note that IWCS does not distribute the presentation slides from either our conference sessions or these webinars. However, please feel free to contact the presenter directly and they will respond individually to you. Today, we welcome Bryant Marchant, test engineer at Burke Tech in Pennsylvania, USA, who will be presenting his paper on cables in wet environments. Brian Marchant is a graduate of the Pennsylvania State University with a Master's of Electrical Engineering. He has worked for Burke Tech for 11 years and is currently a test engineer. Brian, we welcome you to present at today's IWCS webinar series event. All right, good morning. I hope you, go, you can all hear me. This year's presentation was on cables in wet environments. It was a research test set. We actually went and took cables and put them through through the works. So the, the agenda of this presentation is relatively simple. We'll talk about why we did it, what we saw, and that'll be the meat of it. The labs have been doing a lot of tests related to traditional water water blocking outdoor cables and industrial style cables over time and the tests that we were doing were qualification style tests the pass fail does water get through does water reach electronics or you know could this cable if damaged cause a critical failure because it was in a wet location the the test for outside plant cable is the one I have pictured on the right where you have a meter of water applying pressure to your outside plant cable and through a meter of the cable you do not want water to reach the end. The gel block has to stop that. The other tests we've been doing in the lab were the test for industrial connectors where the industrial connectors have to seal because if that factory location where the industrial connector is located is exposed to water, you can't allow the machines, the factory line to go down because of that. So every, everything has to be sealed up. The IP67 test that, that is used to check that is a dunk tank test. You take a meter, meter deep tank of water, connector, connect your cables and connectors together, put it at the bottom of the tank and let it sit. And then when you pull it out, there can't be water. It still has to be able to pass data flow and work, work fine, work perfectly. So through all this testing that we've been doing, the, the things that are required to make sure the cable is capable of meeting the basic environmental needs, safe and useful for the insulation that it's going to be used, there wasn't a lot of talk about what happens to the cable while it is actually wet. I, I get a lot of tech support calls where somebody has a conduit installing concrete and the, the whole thing flooded. And depending on the cable, it would say it was an indoor cable. and the, the, the indoor cable's performance went absolutely absolutely away because of the water or any of that. There, there's a lot of things that can impact the, the cable itself just being exposed to water or liquids for a very long period of time. The field that traveled down the length of the cable can be attenuated just by the change of environment from an air environment to a water environment around your cable, even if your cable has a gel block within it. And note, there's the contrast between some of the designs. The outside plant cables that are designed for the water environment will have the gel blocks. Their core will be significantly different from, say, the industrial cable, which is planned to maybe be in a wet environment because of the connectors and the cable itself, you know, should be able to survive that. But it's not necessarily gel blocks because it might need other parameters, like it might need to be a flexible cable or it might need to be an ultra-shielded solution 
you know, the cable itself could be any number of a variety of designs and still have to be in that environment and meet the pass-fail condition. So then you also have to answer what happens to your cable performance. We uh, were heavily concerned with two parameters at the start of the test. The insertion loss parameter is the one that we were certain would, we would see some kind of impact. Insertion loss is how much signal do you get on the other end of your system when you're sending through your media and as you increase the lossiness of your system, we definitely expect to see a change there. The impedance was the other parameter we expected to see a change in because as you change the uh, dielectric effects around your uh, cable pairs, you expect them to, you know, you change your capacitance, you change your ductus, you expect to see more or less uh, impedance effects on, on your cable. And we're, we weren't exactly certain what magnitude we would see in that effect because mainly it's the environment right around the cable, so the cable core is where the impedance effects are most likely seen. You know, once you get outside the jack of the cable, hopefully hopefully that won't actually change your impedance. It'll, it'll, you know, the signals that are out there are almost always lost anyway, right? So then to do our test set, we decided to go with our standard automated testing for Ethernet cables, category cabling. We've got the TIA 568 B.2, C.2, or 2-D, depending on which style. If you look in the end of the appendixes, it'll tell you what, what your test equipment has to meet in order to actually test cables to the cable parameters in the TIA. So we have our automated tester that we use for pretty much factory floor testing and performance testing, and we went through and performed all the standard tests, the insertion loss, the return loss, the impedance, the crosstalks, the unbalanced parameters. Everything that we'd normally test in a cable in air, we also tested it throughout the entirety of the set at every stage along the way to make sure that we could see any changes. And then in the course of the testing, we reviewed every parameter's results just to see where any changes did occur. I had a full brace of cables. The ones that I, that I included in the paper, paper and in this presentation are these four. There was a few more that we tested but redundant results and some of the results we wanted to keep to ourselves. You know, the ones that we would, I would like to talk today are the uh, an outside plant cable, so an actual gel block cable designed for a wet environment, unshielded completely. You know, you unshielded pairs, unshielded jacket, twisted pairs. A indoor cable. This was a riser style category five e twisted pair. Nothing, nothing particularly special about it, just off-the-shelf indoor cable. And then two industrial line cables with special jacketing materials. These were uh, the, the SF-UTP, the, the foil and shielded outer layer, but not individually shielded pair cables, was one of the high-end, you know, has all the, all the solutions on it. It's flexible, chemical resistant, sunlight resistant, uh, high temp, cold bend, the works. And then I had an unshielded solution, which was slightly less flexible, but still designed for a factory environment, so could could handle the chemical, the sunlight, and the wet environment type conditions. Um, all the cables were tested and checked against the Category 5E specification. There's not much else I need to say about the actual test itself, I don't think. When we started out, everything was tested suspended in air, the referee test method. The, this, this, is, this allows us to compare it straight with our qualification tests on the factory floor. So we've got an awful lot of statistical data to say that the cable was operating as it should have been, no defects, no damage. Very simple test. You suspend the cable on air with the pulleys and then run it to the automated tester and the results fell where expected. We took all the cables that we had and we were going to be putting them into a container with water in them so that we couldn't have them stretched out 20 feet across the set of accumulators. We coiled all the samples and before we put them into the water, we tested them again for all of the parameters. There was a very small impact on return loss results because of the coiling on the unshielded pairs. And for the most part, the results were comparable and we were able to move forward knowing anything, knowing what we saw from this state, everything was still within the bounds of acceptable for TIA and acceptable from what we know cables will do when you coil them. 
we took the coils of those samples and placed them into tanks of water. After they were placed in the tanks of water, the, uh, the ends of the cable, the last meter and a half of cable, was made to made sure to be outside the, the tank of water, and the end of that cable never got wet. So the actual point that we were doing a connection on our automated tester was, was kept dry. We, let's see, the cables were kept at a room temperature, and we just started testing them immediately after we put them into the tank. So. We had a dry test of the coil, then we tested it when it was put in the water, and then every week for a series of about five to six weeks, depending on the cable, we, we tested all the cable parameters for each of those products that I had referred to previously, the outside plant cable, the indoor cable, and the two industrial style products, shielded and unshielded. When we got into looking at the results, I didn't see anything on any of the parameters we weren't expecting to see any issues on. So the unbalanced parameters remain the same, the crosstalk parameters remain the same. We weren't expecting any changes with that because we're not affecting the twisted pairs or anything inside the core of the cable, so that fell in line. The impedance didn't actually change any significant amount from test to test, whether it was coiled dry or coiled one week or two weeks or three weeks or five weeks. The insertion loss parameters changed significantly, and looking at those traces, it was similar to what you'd see with a temperature change or some other environmental change, where the whole of the trace moved up or down, so it got worse, if you want to say it, across the entire frequency band. So trying to compress the massive amount of measurements that we had and products and timeline, I took minimum margins of the insertion loss traces and compress them into graphs where we could talk about what happened over time. There's a little bit more detail in the paper, but I'm going to actually just start progressing into the tabled results, the graph results that we have here on a per product basis. The indoor product, we weren't expecting it to perform phenomenally, and it was rather poor in its results. It started out with a 2% insertion loss margin so was a passing cable. When put in the wet environment, it became a negative 10% insertion loss failure. So a very significant loss in insertion loss margin. A lot of the signal was being consumed by the wet environment. If you had the 100 meter channel, you know, running at, at maximum, this would, this would result in failures and drop, drops, you know, drop packets and all that kind of thing because of just the sheer amount of loss that you gained. Now, granted, if you had a much smaller channel and you had a lot of insertion loss margin just from being not as long, you could probably survive it, but it was a very significant and noticeable change. One of the things that we noticed is that over the course of the five weeks, the amount of loss was actually increasing. So when we pulled the cables out afterwards, they'd been in the tank for five or six weeks, we dried them off completely, and that's how you get the far right data point on this graph. We had dried off the, the coil of the cable, no water on it left, and it still did not recover all the way to a passing result. So far left is our baseline. We started out with 2% margin. We got it wet, it went down to negative 10. We pulled it out and dried it off. It was still at negative 3% margin. So what that is telling us is that over the course of time, in those five weeks the cable was exposed to water, the cable itself must have absorbed some of the water or the plastics in the jacket must have changed their performance parameters. They're flame-rated plastics but not water-rated plastics. So what most likely happened was the porous nature of the jacket material probably absorbed some of the water and the resulting, resulting new jacket is uh, more lossy than it used to be. So the indoor cable definitely was not a... Uh, friendly to being in wet environment because even, even if it was periodically dried, it would slowly degrade in performance as more and more signal got consumed by the wetness that became inherent to the jacket itself. 
I, I am kind of wondering if we had left it in there for half a year, would the uh, core of the cable have gotten wet just because of the porous nature of the outer jacket? But we did not perform that test, although I've seen that kind of result from the tech support stuff that I've done where people had cables in condos and they got wet and the core of the cable. But that, that is a different set, something else to talk about. The outside plant cable, we we're expecting it to perform well because it was a gel block product with a jacket that's designed for UV chemical and, and you know, all that sunlight. I keep saying UV, I'm sorry, sunlight resistance and water dash chemical resistance. So it started out not a tremendous amount of margin, 4% insertion loss margin. When it was put in the dunk tank, it still lost a large amount of insertion loss margin. Looking it over, it was a very long lay length cable. It wasn't a high margin product. It was designed for meeting 5E. And most times when products are designed to just meet 5E, they tend to be cost reduced a bit. So it had very long twist lay lengths and the thin jacket wall to it. So the signals that we're seeing, you know, the, the your 100 megahertz at the end of the band, the minimum margin point for your measurement, you lost margin because some of that signal is outside the outer jacket environment and the lossy water ate it right up. When we dried off the outside plant cable after leaving it in water for five weeks, it actually recovered back to a positive state. Not, not all the way recovered, but it, it wasn't losing, you know, 6 dB per, or 6% permanent insertion loss margin. It only lost a little bit. And this product did not degrade over time as the indoor product did. It pretty much dropped stayed there and then recovered most of the way. So there there was there might have been some water impact on the jacket, but it was not anywhere near as bad. And obviously no water got to the core and it managed to stay functional. Now granted, you wouldn't want to install this style of outside plant, the minimum, absolute minimum margin at 100 meters in a wet environment, because again, you would you would fall into your your over the over your spec line negative result while the cable was wet. So take it with a grain of sand uh, or take a grain of salt. You the ideal case for an outside plant cable like this would be not quite a hundred meters in a wet conduit environment, and it would it would still operate fine. The unshielded industrial cable. This one was not gel blocked in the center. It actually performed rather well. The uh, Outer material, this one, this was not a super high flex product. It is a flame ramp product though, but anyways, it pretty much kept the water out of the core. Since this is designed to be a tougher product than the other two that I've mentioned previously, it actually has a thicker jacket and you know tire twist lace. It's designed to be more durable and tough would be the way to describe it because of the stresses that are expected of it on the factory floor. So in the wet environment, when it was dunked in the tank just like all the other products. We only saw a you know, three to four percent insertion loss margin and the product didn't reach the failing insertion loss level. When we dried it off, it almost completely recovered. Granted about a half a percent, but well within the margin of error of the test of recovery. So that, that gave us something to think about in the end results. What could have caused this one to perform that much better? And then the shielded industrial cable, as described at the beginning, this product was designed to be very durable and tough and had all sorts of design parameters thrown into it for flexibility, armor, you know, resistances and the likes. It started off with a lot of margin. It suffered next to no impact from being put in the water and pretty much stayed a stable insertion loss throughout the entirety of the test. You know, tested as a coil, tested on an accumulator, tested dunked in the water, and then dried off at the end. It's all, it didn't, didn't see the change. Putting them all in one graph together, we can show them and view the contrast between the different procs and what kinds of things we saw from them and try and actually get a good feel for it. So the, I would say the, uh, the procs up top are probably thicker, bigger, more tougher, more durable. The, the very obvious case is the blue one up top, the shielded proc in this industrial graph from the baseline to wet to dry, no impact. There, there is definitely major effects that you can view from this on, if you go back to cable design, what, what you're seeing from the plastics of the material, how thick is the jacket, and what is the style of the cable as far as shielding, unshielding, 
design elements in the cable to make it more or less durable or more or less capable. As noted, everything seemed to recover when dried off some. The products that didn't recover or the product that recovered the worst was the one that wasn't designed to keep water out or wasn't designed with any resistances at all to begin with. We actually had a set not included in the paper or the report where the the cable actually degraded and just kept seeming to degrade over time. At one point, we we were we uh, we had lost about 18 dB or 18 percent of margin from beginning to end of the test when we stopped it, just because it kept getting worse and worse as the longer we left it inside the uh, the water tank. The the, there are definitely different effects that can happen based on what different styles of plastics and cable designs you have. And it'll, it'll be a matter of what amount of margin you want to have in your solution for what cable you'd want to install. Obviously, you would not install the indoor cable in your outdoor environment because we know it'll, it'll, it'll become ruined and not recover. If you have the outdoor cable in there, at least it'll be stable and you might lose some margin, but it'll... It, it, it will keep keep the core dry. It'll still function, and then if you have even more capable and durable cables, they they might not even suffer any negative impact at all from being put in a wet environment, which is actually kind of ideal for your potentially wet, potentially not wet industrial factory floor. You know, the what unknown unknown environment next to unknown machines doing equip doing doing processes. So trying to wrap it up and conclude it. Even, even in any case, the putting the cable in a wet environment, if the, if the core can see the environment, you, you will degrade your, your performance. You will lose margin. You'll lose signal at the other end. The better plastics, the different styles of plastics, especially to get a less impact, less lossy, less absorbing of water, will have a major impact on how much total loss you see and, of course, thicker jackets or shielding or tighter twist pairs so that you don't see the environment as much have a significant impact on how much signal will get lost based on how wet it is. And, you know, the, we, we could probably even break it down into pieces and parts based on what was added to make the cable tougher in what ways, but going, in, going into a bit more detail. The, uh, the future work that could be recommended for looking into this and trying to optimize a product for wet environments. Obviously, a plastic study. The, the, the four cables I had here, each one had different plastics on their outer jacket layers, and that was definitely part for the outside plant versus the indoor cables, and definitely between the indoor cables and the uh, industrial. And then extended tests, taking, taking the products that, you know, the, the, the non-gel block cables and leaving them in water forever, making sure that there's no water penetration, that the product remains stable, or any of that sort of thing could really provide some good information for for what would be best for a wet cable. That's that's all I have to say about this test set from what's off the top of my mind and all that. I think I'm about ready for the question and answer session. Hopefully I didn't yes, go too fast. Very much. No, you did great, Brian, and thank you very much. And at this time we will ask as many questions from the attendees as, as time permits. Um, I'm going to start with this first question. What is the primary differences in materials used for jackets and insulation for industrial versus indoor versus outdoor plant cables? The, the materials are, are designed to, to meet specific requirements for those environments. The indoor cable is definitely going to be focused on flame rating and performance. So an indoor cable might need to be in a riser or a plenum space, might need to have long-term no smoking when it burns, like that kind of parameters. It's not designed to be super flexible. It's not designed to be exposed to too much, you know, harsh environment type stuff. An outside plant cable will definitely have, you know, it's almost always a thick black, you know, carbon black jacket, UV rated thing that's designed for durability because they're usually dragged across hard surfaces in the install and it has to be able to keep the water out. And so there, there's a combination there where the gel block is to keep is the absolute last barrier. If the, there's a hole in the jacket, you want the gel block inside the outside plant to keep the water out. But the outer jacket layer is your first defense, and it has to survive in sunlight because there's the sun outdoors, and that can degrade all sorts of plastics. And you know, also 
be tough and waterproof. The industrial plant cables are a wide range. There are, depending on the application and the environment, the industrial plant cables can be more durable, more flexible, chemically resistant, you know, weld splatter resistant. There, there, there is an awful diverse range of plastics that are used in there. In general, they tend to be tougher than the other two, but it'll be on a design by design basis which cables have what properties. So for the industrial line cables in this specific set, I had a high flex, um, pretty much extra expensive, everything in one you know, resistant cable, and then I had a lower flexibility, but still thick and heavily durable cable. So the, 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 the plastics are quite the range, especially if you were to like take a plenum cable and throw it in the mix too, because those are known for their non-flexibility, but it, it'll vary cable to cable based on what your, what your design goal was, what you needed the cable to do. Hope that helps. Okay, very good. Th yeah, thank you. Next question. Uh, in addition to shielding, are there other moisture barriers that should be considered within cable designs to maximize performance retention? Let's see. The same sort of things that would impact like your high-end alien crosstalk resistance will be the same sort of things that will impact your ignoring the environment resistance. So the, the, the variety of twist lays and the tightness of the twist lays you know, how, will, will help keep more of the signal within, within the twisted pair and not getting outside the jacket where it's getting absorbed by the water. The, if you have other like overwrap layers inside the cable, anything that could do that, the thickness of the jacket will have an impact because a very thin walled material, your, your pairs will be almost butt up against the jacket and then almost right into the, uh, right into the, right into the water that's around it. Um, you could even you could even look at something, for instance, how tight the jacket is on the pairs, because if you have the pairs in the core with an air gap around them, you know, a loose tube style extrusion, and then the jacket is not being tight on them, you'll you'll definitely see a better result than if you had one where you know a very tight pressure extrusion around the pairs, so there's like no air space at all, and you know the the, the style of cables I'm thinking here are the ones that look like a, a circular tube compared to where you can actually see the pairs looking at the outside of the jacket. The, the, like, I, I would say twist lays and jacket style will probably be your big impacts on your, what design features would, would affect whether or not wetness around the cable will actually eat up any of your signal, affect your insertion loss. Okay, thank you. Next question, by performance, are you looking primarily at transmission did you or should you look at physical degradation of cable materials as well, as that could impact both the cable integrity and transmission performance? So you're talking about actually taking the cable, taking the plastics and seeing if the, the compounds change run through the FTIR, um, seeing if they've changed weights or masses by adding water or losing any of their special compounds or maybe even burning them after they've gone through this because some of the com components might have been leached out. I didn't go into that depth in this specific test set. In this specific test set, I was very perf high frequency performance concerned because that was something that I was seeing as a factor that was getting ignored and I wanted to look into it because it'll have an impact. The cables. The cables will, you know, you, you may design it for environment A or B, but it will be installed in a wet case sooner or later. And knowing what will happen is a, was the key thing I wanted to sort out in this set. I could definitely see, you know, a, a change in your plastics depending on what's in the water and how long you're exposed to it. If you, if you leach out some of the compounds, you could lose flexibility or if water seeped into the, in, even, even the outer layer of a cable, it could affect what happens when it gets heated up or, you know, if it, you try to move or change it and the outer, outer layer has become more brittle because, or, or more, or maybe even softer depending on how it's exposed to the, you know, I, I could, I could see the, the plastics changing. I am not a plastics engineer, so I, I am not the expert to ask as to what could happen, but I could definitely see other styles of performances changing as a result of a long-term wet exposure to your, to your cable. Okay, thank you. Next question. 
Are there standards in, pl in place specifically for wet, harsh environments? Do these same standards include other exposure issues such as oil or potential solvents, paint, or chemicals? We're going to interesting territory. The, uh, the outside plant cables that I'm used to dealing with are not listed or standardized. There's requirements for if you're going to be installing a cable outdoors, you want to be, you know, water blocked and sunlight resistant. But as far as the other things, like usually they're not burn listed because of the, they would not meet that. And I see a lot of outside plant cables out there that aren't listed or standardized or tested at all. They're just, you know, they're, they're marked as use in outdoor environments. And since there's outdoor isn't really regulated as much by the NEC, you don't have you don't have the same markings and requirements on there. As far as requirements for cables that could be used in an oil environment or a chemical environment or one of those things, we're seeing a lot of development in that direction for industrial products. Like people, people are looking into the MICE levels or they're going to the TIA standards on the industrial lines with, you know, Rockwell Automation and all of them and looking into what, what is needed for cables to be in environments depending on where it is, you know, the edge of the factory or all the way down into the factory or on an oil rig. There's definitely standards and requirements you can for specific cases. It, it's slowly becoming more and more organized over time. As far as the, the products at hand, like the outside plant cables that I was handling here, the outside plant cable was just it can handle sunlight and water. That was all it was all it was all it was marked and sold as. The indoor cable couldn't handle any of that. The two industrial cables that I tested, I believe, were tested, not those specific ones, but that design was tested for oil resistance as well. So that is definitely a factor that's out there, and there are standards for testing it. I do not off the top of my head know how many of them combine into which cable requirements, especially considering many of the industrial products have a customer per customer what needs set changes, you know, different standards based on what they're using their products for. Do you understand? Okay. Okay, next, next question, Brian. Uh, was the water at room temperature during the test? Yeah. Yes, it was. The, the, the drums that I was holding the water in were placed inside the labs because it was a uh, I believe the middle of summer when I was doing the testing. So if I had had them not at room temperature, we would have seen something like a couple percentage loss just from room temperature to, to high temperature outdoor type thing. Or, so I, I kept them in the labs and kept that, kept that maintaining temperature just to try and keep everything stable. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, next question. For indoor cable, was the jacket PVC, did you test with different jacket materials? I have additional things that I tested that were indoor cables. I'm not going to get into too much detail. We can take that one offline because it comes down to I had, I have them in my head sorted out by like product name and performance and things like that. So it, it'd be one of those ones where I'd want to discuss it on a, on a product by product. Yes, the, the one that I was referring to in this set was a, was a PVC. But I have I have some other ones that I tested that were, you know, FEP, and then I had I think a PE product as well. But it, 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 as well as ones where we can go into a lot more detail if we take it offline. Okay, good, noted. Um, next question: What would you expect for results if the indoor cable had a shield? Interesting question. Like most times when people talk about the shielding, they expect it to give you complete, you know, ignoring the environment. I, I actually had a, I'm not going to say the brand name, but I had a product in that was uh, not gel blocked but had a shield. The, it, it, I think it comes down to uh, shield coverage and all that, but the product that I was looking at for that, saw some loss, but it was still simply better than the indoor cable that we tested here. The shield, uh, what's the word for it? The shield buffers it out. Like it, it takes out a lot of the environment's impact on the cable itself. But depending on how well your jacket is made, you may still have some water penetration, some lossiness, and depending on how good your coverage is, even with overlap, your core may see some of the environment. So if, if the environment gets lossier, 
then you will lose signal. So short version, shielding helps because it's more layers and it's more separation from your environment. Shielding isn't perfect because it, it isn't it isn't a absolute barrier to water. And your electrical signals, depending on how your shield is designed and, and overlapped and laid, you may not have 100% coverage is the way to describe it, you know what I mean? Okay, next question. Um, can you divulge jacket materials for each cable? I don't have that written down right here. We may want to take that offline because I'm not sure which things I'm supposed to be talking about as far as that one. I, well, I, 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 I have it written down. I do not have it in this presentation. I don't have it in the top of my head. So definitely take it offline. Okay. Bear with me, I'm just, uh, can you elaborate further on the type of plastics used for the jackets of each tested cable and the type of water blocking technology used, i.e. gel, SAP, et cetera? Okay, um, wow, everyone's interested in the plastic side of things. I should have got my chemistry dudes in here for this presentation. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I'll talk about the gel stuff and, and we'll do a real quick thought on the, on the plastics. Uh, I can, the indoor cable was definitely a flame rated, non-flexible, I think PVC style cable. The outside plant I thought was a, you know, tough PE type material, you know, a, a dark non-flex whatever. The two industrial cables, one was a high flex and the other one was a, I guess it would be medium tough. I don't remember what exact compounds are used for those specific operations for high flex and non-high flex. As far as the blocking, the only one that had any blocking material in it at all was the outside plant cable, and it had the standard, you know, icky pick uh, gel water block that's used in out outside plants since time immemorial, you know what I mean? Um, as far as any other compounds, the shielded product had a couple of extra layers because it had, you know, shielded mylar and braid, but other than that, the cores of the cable were not complicated you know, twisted pairs. So the uh, the only one with any real features for, for for water blocking was the outside plant, and the only one with extra stuff that, that helped out inside the jacket was the shielded one. So then it just came down to what compounds were on the outside, and as stated in the last question, I don't have the exact compounds memorized, so we'll have to take it offline. Okay. Um... Next question, how will the shielded and unshielded cable perform in an icy water during winter? Okay, so cold temperature, I don't expect the difference in temperature to have too much of an impact on water permeation and insertion loss. If you make, some, if you make cables colder, they tend to do slightly better on your insertion loss test, but if you're adding water, you're going to make it much more lossy. Um, the main thing I always come across with ice is the, the the general problem that you can have with ice in a conduit in a in a in an install and in any of those sorts of things ice can do some severe damage to your cable if you have ice forming around the cable the the the, the example case i tell people why i'm on tech support is you know ice forming can shear the concrete ice forming can break the conduit ice forming can break through the cable itself when when you make cables colder especially the indoor products, but sometimes the outdoor products or anything like that, you can get to a point where the cable jacket becomes more brittle. Really, I do not see too many good cases where cable being exposed to ice is anything but, but ruin, you know what I mean? You'd ruin the cable one way or another either by, you know, ice actually destroying the cable itself or just you, you if, even if you just penetrated the cable with, with ice formation, it would... Uh, Allow, allow water to get closer to the core, which would increase your loss. Um, yeah, ice, ice and water, not, not good. <laughs> I, I can't, I, I should probably be, try to be more technical on this, but that, that is one of the cases you should really avoid. You should avoid getting ice, grow, you know, forming around your cable. And as far as just water being cold, 
I, I, I had room temperature water on the cable. I don't really expect too much of a permeation difference between room temperature water and cold water. Uh, you might be able to figure something out if the if the cable plastics permeability changed when it got cold, but I really don't think that would have as much of an impact as you think it would. The real, the real danger is just the ice itself. Okay. Um, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Brian, for presenting this very interesting and important topic today. Please note the contact points being shown should you wish to contact Brian after today's event. Each of these IWCS webinar series presentation events are recorded and will be archived in the IWCS.org website. It normally takes up to two weeks for these to be posted. The IWCS webinar series will conduct presentations events on a monthly basis. Webinar events will take place on the third Friday of each month at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA time. Our next scheduled webinar event will be on Friday, February 15th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA time. Each of you will be receiving an announcement for the event a few weeks prior. Please feel free to share our announcements with your colleagues so that they can join in and register as well. For over 67 years, the IWCS International Cable and Connectivity Symposium has been the recognized leader showcasing new technologies in cable, connectivity products, processes, and applications. Our next annual international conference will take place on Sunday, September 29th through Wednesday, October 2nd, 2019, at the Charlotte Convention Center in Charlotte, North Carolina, USA. In addition, the third annual UL and IWCS China Cable and Connectivity Symposium will take place on Monday, March 25th, through Wednesday, March 27th, 2019, at the Marriott Hotel City Center in Shanghai, China. Please visit our website at iwcs.org for more event details. In just a moment, you will see a brief survey so that you can provide us your feedback and comments on today's event so that we can further improve this webinar series for you. Thank you for participating, and this concludes today's event.